Sport Pods. Hi, welcome to Michael Calvin's Football People. I'm joined by Tony Hodson from the Coach's Voice platform and by Richard Amofa of The Athletic. I've also been to see Brighton's technical director, David Weir. We talked about global recruitment and the dangers of buying someone off the back of a stellar World Cup. But first, it's what we're obliged to refer to as Le Crunch. Defeat France, the holders, and anything seems possible. So Tony, is Saturday night the moment of truth for England? Yes, in that it's the next game. I think if England get through that game, there'll be two more, potentially two more moments of truth that might just be just as challenging. Um, in terms of the game on Saturday, England arguably have the toughest tie of the quarterfinals. Croatia possibly do against Brazil, but France are a hugely strong team. They're the defending champions. They come into this tie on the back of a pretty straightforward passage really through to the last eight. But they're doing it this time not only without Karim Benzema as last time, but also two central midfielders who led them to, to the title four years ago. Now, Chiumeni is a sensational footballer and Rabiot is, uh, we might talk a bit about him later, he's, he's, a very, he's a very able deputy to Kante and Pogba. But they can be got at. And England have a set, again, as we'll talk about later, say young, vibrant, and mostly important for me, quick set of attackers playing around, for me, one of the most intelligent and versatile strikers in world football. Depending on how they approach the game, I think they have a real chance. And the winners of this quarterfinal, they will have a more than realistic chance of winning the whole thing, won't they, Rich? Of course, of course. I think both sides will look at each other and say, look, you know, if we can win this game, if we can beat the other side, we can we can beat anyone. And as you say, if we look at the potential routes to the final, I think both sides will fancy their chances in the semi-final should they win this game. I think Tony summed it up very well, you know, the moments of truth will just keep coming. And as you say, I think from an English perspective, I think it will be, uh, you know, seen as a kind of a, not a big scout, but in terms of Southgate's detractors, you look at the last two tournaments, you know, 2018, it was, oh, England had an easier route to the semis. And in the Euros, it was, oh, okay, we're on home soil. But every time we came up against a, a world elite superpower, that's when England England would fall. So to win this game against, as you say, the holders, France would be a massive scout for England. Um, a massive achievement and same, similarly for France you know if England got such a depth of talent that if France can get past England as you say they'll fancy themselves against anyone and they've been superb already in this tournament so yeah but both both will definitely fancy themselves should they get into the last four We do have a strange relationship with our national team don't we you know there's the, always this mood swing from theatrical pessimism to wild optimism so going into this game if you look objectively at that England squad, greater maturity and depth since you know, four years ago. And there's a sense that there are no real surprises in tournament football for that group anymore. Yeah, I agree. I think in England, certainly certainly in the past 20 years or so, I think we've been reared on teams that are probably less than the sum of their parts. You could argue why that is, I would suggest, limited coaching and poor morale for the most part that's absolutely no longer the case with this with this England squad and I think Gareth Southgate's greatest achievement that he has built over quite a long period of time now he's been in the job a squad of players who genuinely enjoy playing for England and they don't carry with them that burden of over expectation and ultimate failure that seemed to blight their predecessors and now as you said about the greater maturity there's got a heady mix of older players who actually if you look at them seem to reserve in, in recent times at least that they're, they're they're better, better performances for the national team. I'm thinking Pickford, Maguire. You could argue Sterling and Stones as well. And then, as, as you said, a younger generation of talent who, who'd come into this international setup that is, is a different to the way it was in, in, in years gone by. I think tactically, the message of, of subtly changed over time, perhaps, but I think the longevity of Southgate and also Steve Holland with him, who's an important part of that team, is such that they're... There remains, how would you sort of a level of clarity, that word that we say every time, and continuity that I think benefits the players. So we may not always watch on and agree with the tactics that they employ, but I think anyone questioning the results would, would need their head looking, wouldn't they? Uh, yeah, I think so. It doesn't stop them, but um, that's OK. That's, that's a cultural thing for football in this country, isn't it? We don't have to be rocket scientists to work out where the key areas of the game will be decided, Rich. Obviously, 
it doesn't actually begin and end with Kylian Mbappe, but if you look at it, how England deal with him will be decisive, won't it? It just has to be. It just has to be because, you know, Mbappe is in fantastic form, already building the lead as the golden boot at the top of that. But also, you know, the creative elements to his game and, and, and his obvious pace. And of course, a lot has been said about Mbappe against Carl Walker. And well, no, they've, they've had even contests in the past, you know, face each other four times, you know, two wins, two losses. And I think Mbappe's got two goals and one assist against Walker in, in, in that time. But... You know, there, there are other key other areas on the pitch, you know, of course, neutralising Mbappe, but you know, Dembele on the other wing against Shaw, that would be a really interesting matchup there because, again, Shaw's obviously improved defensively, but we all know Dembele's pace and his end product is fantastic. And, and then, of course, you've got Giroud, who's on fire at the moment, and, and Griezmann, who in the last 16, I thought was, was phenomenal. And if it wasn't for maybe Giroud getting the, the French goal scoring record and Mbappe taking the headlines of his two goals, he was probably third up to be man of the match because he, he in that kind of number 10 role, was just popping up everywhere. You know, he'd intercept a pass in the edge of his box and then just seamlessly just float towards the edge of the box with a few one-twos, a few give and goes. Next thing you know, he's played a pass up wide and he's either pushing beyond Giroud or finding pockets of space just behind him. So... France have, uh, you know, their threats all over the pitch and it's, it's something that England will really need to think about. I think if England were to start with the same eleven which they did against Senegal, then you'd probably see the likes of Henderson helping out on the, with, with Sean on the left and, and Bellingham helping out with um, Mbappe and Walker on, on the right-hand side. And I think that will be really important because, as you say, to stop both wingers cutting inside and, and you know, paying those one-twos off Giroud and, 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 and causing threats in those kind of half spaces, I think is really important. So, yes, of course, Mbappe versus Walker is the, it's the key headline, but, I mean, France have so many threats across the pitch that it's important to neutralise those as well. Mm, yes, when you look at England, together with Portugal, they were the top scorers up until this uh, stage of the tournament with 12 each. They've got the breakout star of Qatar in, in Jude Bellingham. Uh, but, ultimately, do you think, Tony, will success be down to what was identified pretty widely pre-tournament as the the weak point for England, i.e., their defence? You, you could argue that, couldn't you? If you if you look at your previous World Cups going back in my lifetime, if not quite as far back into yours, um, well, thank you, mate. <laughs> always here for you. Um, Brazil Brazil ninety four was built. In fact was built on a miserly defence. France 98 conceded one goal from open play in the whole tournament. Italy 2006 built on an all-time great defence. Spain 2010 when every knockout game 1-0. France kind of belied that four years ago, didn't they? They had that crazy last 16 game against Argentina and conceded two in the final to Croatia. But they, they were still, even in those games, they were oddly mostly a team in, in control. England have had their moments defensively in this tournament. We, know, we all know Southgate was referred to himself as being a bit grumpy after they conceded two late against Iran. And we conceded a couple of early chances to Senegal. But this is an experienced unit that knows each other really, really well. And they'll be going into this game as confident as you could probably hope for them to be on the back of the, the three clean sheets. France are really different opponents. But actually, what's important for me is what we do in possession. Because I think if you look at the, the, the two teams that we've lost to, two games that we've lost in the recent big tournaments that Rich alluded to against Croatia in 2018 and, and Italy in 2020, both games where we went ahead and then sat back and conceded possession. Granted, different different formation to what it looks like we might play at the weekend, although I still wouldn't rule out Southgate changing to a back three. But if we sit back and allow those teams possession, then we invite them on to take advantage of, of what potential vulnerabilities there are in our defence. If we have the confidence to, whether we score or not, keep possession, maintain the ball, play it quickly and intelligently then I think we've got a real, real chance to get in behind them and cause them more problems than they can cause up, whether, whether it's Mbappe or not. But that requires the confidence and the bravery to keep hold of the ball for long periods, which we did against the United States, much to everyone's <coughs> potential boredom. But then the USA sat back deeper than France are likely to sit against us. And there, are, there is that opportunity, if France come and press high as we play it around at the bat, that we will be able to break the lines and get through them. And that, for me, is... is more important than just saying we've got to be resolute defensively because that's always the case. Mm. We say, and you know, this is what Liverpool could have won, Tony, Trumani has done exceptionally well in, in that French midfield. But if you look at England, do they have a fundamental advantage in that trio of Rice, Bellingham and Henderson? 
because of the balance that that gives the England team. It's certainly the best that I can remember in my very, very, very long memory. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. The, the balance is, is, is great to see. You say you've got Rice sitting, you've got Bellingham and, uh, and Henderson driving, and, and as I said earlier, you know, helping with the fullbacks when, when they're providing cover. There's legs, there's energy. And I think all, all three are, are really good when they're facing play. I, you know, driving for We know Rice can drive forward, of course, in this tournament. He's playing a kind of a, a different role, almost, you know, just sitting and, and playing it very simple. And allowing Bellingham to, to drive forward and allowing Henderson to bomb in, in, into the box. And you say that they're solid, they, they can be compact, but as you say, they can also break and, and get goals as well. My only concern is... We saw against Senegal, there was difficulty building play from the back. I feel like all, all three could could improve with their back to play, i.e., you know, receiving the ball from the goalkeeper, from the centre backs, and, and building possession from there because I think that's also important. But as Tony said, you know, we have to we have to play to our strengths, and I think if you know playing on the front foot is key, and if we can get the ball, I'm not saying get the ball forward, but if we can try and play through the midfield as much as possible, that would be great, and get the ball to our our dangerous wingers and dangerous forwards through the midfield, that that would be fantastic. But as you say, there is that that base of those three to to build on, and even if it was a a more reserved performance from us, I you know sitting back, those three are more adept, more than adept of at, you know holding their position, being solid, being resolute there as well. And then also on a counter attack, they've, they've got the legs to get beyond the likes of Kane and the other forwards as well. So it's a really good balance. And it's something that I think we've been really looking for from an England perspective for, for a number of years now, to have three players who fully complement each other on and off the ball. And it's really nice to see that in this tournament, it all seems to be coming together. Mm. Rich talked about England's strengths there, Tony. Can that be embodied by one man, Harry Kane? There's a player who's evolving before our eyes, isn't he? Yeah, he is. I can't remember who made this point. Uh, it wasn't me, although I'm going to claim it now. His ability to, <laughs> to score the kind of goals that he does as, as an old-fashioned number nine, and he's finished against Senegal, you just, there was never any doubt, was there, when he went through, he was going to score that. But also, combine that with his ability to kind of drop in and become this kind of playmaker, cre- creator character. Like, is there anyone quite like him in world football at the moment? And if there is, is, is there anyone better? He also... Uh, that, of course, was home to Tottenham, I think, with, with you know, Son running in behind and, and now Kulosevsky and Richarlison's there as well. England have, have reaped the benefit of that, I think. And you've got players who can run in behind with great pace, Saka, Rashford, who can take advantage of that in the way Son does at Tottenham. But also those cleverer players who can take the ball facing defences in a bit more space that was created by Kane moving Foden, Grealish. The challenge for England, I guess, is getting players into the box when Kane moves away to combine. That hasn't always worked particularly well. I think we saw with Henderson's goal against Senegal that, that it's a great example of runners coming into space vacated by Kane. The only question again is, will they have the boldness to, to get forward against France against a much more offensively dangerous team? One of the things they said about Kane is that this is a guy who just has this absolute shot of belief and confidence running through him. And he's had that ever since he broke into the Tottenham first team. And... It must just be a wonderful thing for the players around him to see and feed off because he is phenomenal. So players around him, Rich, Saka and Foden. Now, we're in a World Cup where teams, I'm thinking Belgium, Denmark, Spain, and players, no more obvious example than Cristiano Ronaldo, almost growing old or outdated overnight. Yet those two, do they embody the ambition and the vigour and the importance of youth. A hundred percent. I think, you know, when you're young, you're fearless, you know, you, you're not afraid of, of trying things, being inventive on the ball. And I think that's all, it's all we want to see. And I think that is something that's really hamstrung England sides of old. Tony spoke about it earlier as well, in terms of, you know, that morale within the camp. And, you know, we every tournament when we've been knocked out, it's always been, oh, we, we, we need that player who not necessarily number 10, but someone who's who's good in the final third, i.e. can pick up the ball in pockets, is comfortable in the ball and is willing to express themselves. And I think in those two especially, not even to bring in the likes of Grealish, Madison, who's not played yet, Rashford, you know, we've got a real depth of young players, young attacking players who are fearless, confident, skillful, 
and willing to express themselves. And I think you have to give Southgate credit for allowing that and cultivating that that environment and allowing these young players to express themselves. Because at the end of the day, you know, this is their talent. This is what they're in the squad to do, is to create, to score goals, to make goals. And you're only going to get that if you allow an environment where they're able to express themselves. So seeing the the vibrancy of youth is... um, it's great to see. And it, I guess football's becoming a young man's game now. You know, we've seen young players breaking, you know, even younger, even earlier than than, than before. And as I say, it's, it's, it just gives that sense of enthusiasm throughout the side. And, you know, the likes of the older, the older heads, the likes of, you know, the, your Hendersons, it must give them that such a, such a vibe, such a vitality to, you know, try and keep up with these young players. And, you know, he's doing a fantastic job with that. So, yeah, I think this season, I mean, this tournament, I should say, we've seen, you've definitely seen, not necessarily a change of the guard, but a kind of shift that I, and then seeing those young players really come into the fore. Because sometimes, we've not always seen that. Sometimes it's, you know, things are born on, you say, experience gets you through, of course, or mistakes or moments of quality. But seeing young players almost taking charge and saying, no, this is, this is my stage, you know, I'm here to dominate, I deserve to be here, I, I think it's been really refreshing to see. Yeah, well, there's no better young player than Bellingham, 19, which is just mind-boggling, really, what he's achieving. The auction begins, doesn't it? I think it's probably been bubbling under for a while, hasn't it, Tony? You will say, and many others will also say, that Liverpool's a perfect emotional fit. PSG are sniffing around. Just are we looking here at the player of his generation? The player. I'm absolutely convinced I'm looking at the player of my lifetime. Absolutely convinced of it. I've, I've never seen a player do... I, I was talking to a friend a few days ago and I was waxing lyrical about Jude Bellingham and they asked me... They're not, they don't follow football particularly and they asked me who, who like, of the other big-name players in, in world football I would most liken him to and from the English game. And I couldn't really think. Like, he, he kind of... He has that ability to go box-to-box, box, that great energy, but also that great quality on the ball that kind of Steven Gerrard had. But he probably seems to be probably a bit more positionally kind of disciplined than than Gerrard ever was. He's got that ball-winning ability that kind of Roy Keane had across the entire pitch without kind of the violence that went with it. (laughs) Um, But then he's also got that ability to combine in really advanced areas and kind of just just fly past people with the ball in the way that that Paul Gascoigne had a little bit. And uh, we say, you know, he's 19, and there are certain areas in which he can definitely improve. Rich alluded to one a moment ago, kind of back to play, but... He's just so exciting and he plays with such maturity, that word again. And I just think he has got it in him to be whatever he wants to be. As to where he ends up, emotion would have to play a part if he went to Liverpool because the club certainly don't have the finances. It does feel like the courtship's been going on a, quite a long time, and, and cert, certainly in the international setup with Henderson and Trent Alexander Arnold. But, you know, you know, you and I get on great, Mike. It doesn't mean the coach's voice has the cash to tempt you away from the good shit BT, does it? <laughs> so as as to as to where else as to where else he could end up, I mean it's the usual suspect, isn't it? I mean if it becomes a bidding war, an open bidding war, I think for me it's just a case of waking me up when it's over. But wherever he ends up, he will be a star, absolute star. Yeah, well, Bellingham might be the exception to the rule that you don't sign someone off the back of a stellar tournament. That was one of many discussion points during my conversation with Brighton's technical director David Weir. On one level, they might just be the best club team at the World Cup. Here's why. So, David, thanks very much for joining us, first off. Brighton had eight players at the World Cup. Calculation on the back of an envelope, total investment around about 50 million max, I would think. They're obviously worth a lot more now. Does that sum up the importance of recruitment in a nutshell? I think the valuations obviously help. I think recruitment of players and staff is always really important. And I think there's a lot of things go into it. There's a lot of variables. I think you can see these players playing in the World Cup. Obviously, they've got ability, they've got technical ability, and they've got a a personality that allows them to do that. So I think, in my view, recruitment's a number of things. There's obviously a subjective element and an objective element, and the best recruitment is when you get both of those things right. And I think, and I hope, 
that Brighton and Hove Albion continue to do that, to try and combine subjective and objective as well as you can, to try and get in a position whereby, you know, we as a Premier League club have got eight players at the World Cup. I mean, that's pretty impressive. And there's a lot of work gone into that and a lot of people that deserve credit for that, none more so than the players themselves. But I think it, it reflects really well on the good work that's been done at this club over a number of years. Mm. The players never get greater exposure than at a World Cup. But how dangerous is it to almost like buy off the back of a tournament, even though it might be a good one? You've only got a small sample size, yeah. haven't you? I think that's the key. Yeah. If you're basing your recruitment purely on a, a World Cup, then I think you might be making a bad decision. Ultimately, those players have gone to the World Cup for a reason, so there will be a bigger sample size somewhere to do more of your work. And I think, again, combining that with the ability to perform at an elite level on the world stage when required is also a nice asset and a nice attribute to have. It's harder to measure. It only comes around every four years of World Cup and not everybody can get there to get that opportunity and some great players have missed out. Whereas I think it can't be your only factor in terms of recruiting someone. I think it's somebody can go there, perform in that stage, and the ultimate test, once that happens once every four years, is, deserves credit as well. Mm. I suppose it's, it's all about being smarter and a bit more, a bit sharper, maybe a bit more subtle. At Brighton, when you're looking to recruit, do you have to pick your markets? Because there are some markets, bigger markets, which are probably saturated and the, and the money that they would be asking for a half form player or a three quarter form player will be maybe beyond your budget. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I, th I don't think we hide away from that. We don't or haven't bought Premier League ready footballers. Very rarely have we brought Premier League ready footballers. Maybe the, the exception will be the Adam Lallanas, the, the Danny Welbecks who have come later in their careers and on free transfers. So we're buying ready-made Premier League players, but at the other end of their career. So the majority of players that we we invest in and we, we're looking for are players who are not quite there yet, but we think have got a really strong chance of doing that. And we've got to provide an environment and a culture and an opportunity, which I think sometimes can be the hardest thing. So you've got to have a coach who's willing to give that opportunity. And that comes in in many different ways. So we've got to utilise the things we've got, which is being a Premier League club, being able to operate on that stage to try and maybe bridge the gap in terms of the things that we can't do or won't do in terms of paying big, big transfer fees, big, big wages. We've got to sell the opportunity. We've got to sell the pathway that we as a club feel gives these players. And we've got to show them examples of what's been done before. And when you look at some of the players who've come into our club and some are still here and doing really, really well. Some playing at the World Cup and some that have moved on as well. So I think that's also something that you shouldn't be afraid of in terms of some players want to go and play in the Champions League, want to go and play in European Cup finals and things like that. So we're not there yet. We want to try and get there. Mm. But some of the clubs are doing that. And I think you've got to recognise at some stage some players do have to move on. And then you reinvest and you start the cycle again. Yeah, well, let's, let's take as an example... Ecuador, as a market, probably you're into quicker than most. You've got three players come out of that, Casado, Estepinian and Sarmiento. Is that part of the trick? Create the market before there's even a market existing? I think it is, but those three players are very, very different. Although three of those are at World Cup, they've came in very different ways. Moise's high talent, young player, we recognised early and managed to make it happen, which takes a lot of work and doesn't happen by accident. And it's a lot of skilled recruitment, identification, and, and that process to, to identify and actually get the player into the building was very complicated. So his pathway subsequently involved a loan, it involved a time in the building, and it involved getting an opportunity, which to be honest happened when another player got injured. So some elements of fortune involved You've got to be there to get the opportunity. And we, we made a series of decisions that allowed him to get there. So he's a very different case to Pervis, who, who we bought because we had the team need. We just sold Mark Cucurella and we had to find a solution. So Pervis was playing. He played in Champions League games. He played for an elite level club. So you're buying a very different thing than we were with Moises. 
And then Jeremy, we brought Jeremy as a young player, as a t an under 21 player initially, really liked, we knew him obviously, and we'd done our work. We really liked what he saw. We had a pathway within the club that allowed him to jump very quickly from under 21s to first team. And, you know, he's still making that transition. He's not an established first team player, but he's played in the World Cup now. He's had some exposure in the Premier League. So although all three players are playing in the World Cup for Ecuador, their journeys have been very different. You know, there's been many people involved and lots of different situations that have allowed each individual to get here. But it's great that they are here and it's great that, you know, we've got that little colony of Ecuadorians. Because if you, if you think about it, Sarmiento intrigues me because in many ways he embodies the underlying lessons of modern football, which are, you know, it's a global game. Players are multinational, really. You know, yeah. if you think about it, Jeremy could have played, well, he did play for England at youth level, went through the Charlton Academy, Benfica Academy, and he's here. So that's actually, if you're looking at a case study of a modern young footballer, that's quite typical, isn't it? Yeah. It is, and the ECPP system, which has developed a lot of good young English footballers, I think it's really important that we recognise it's also developed a lot of good footballers for other countries as well. Yeah. Jeremy being a really good example of that, and some players you know, playing for other countries in the World Cup doing that as well, whereby the platform that England has provided for development of young players over the last number of years and none more so when you look at the England squad at present in the World Cup. Some of the talent they've got on the pitch and off the pitch and not even on the plane is, is phenomenal. And Jeremy played for England at a younger age group and obviously thought he had a better chance of representing Ecuador at the elite level, which he's gone and done. And I think that is a great thing. It's a really good story. It's a really exciting thing to do. So there's, again, as I said earlier, there's a multitude of different ways to get to that elite level. And Jeremy's story, you know, is a fascinating one. And and the pathway, I think, that I've said earlier, whereby you can make that jump from 21s into first team very quickly. And he's not made it 100%. He's not a, you know, a consistent member of the team, but he's had that opportunity. And, I, and as I said earlier as well, that opportunity sometimes is the hardest thing. Mm. You talk about doing the work, you know, putting the miles in, as it were for when you actually go and get, out and get a player. Can you give those listening to this a bit of an insight into how much work, the level of detail that's required, and actually also the number of people who are invested in this one player? Yeah. I think, again, every case is different. I think we found during COVID, which really restricted your travel, it really restricted what you were allowed to do, and it almost forced you into doing a lot more work virtually, by video, you know, we felt that that allowed us to get a bigger sample size, to look at more detail, to actually build up a database that when you increase the sample size and you, you can reduce the error that you make from one or two viewings that might be at either end of the spectrum, I think that was a bit of learning for us. And while you can, and some people love live viewings and you can see things that you can't, data can't measure or numbers can't measure. I think it's just getting that balance right between still having that subjective element that allows you to, a human element that, you know, a feel or a touch or a taste that, that helps while also backing it up with something, you know, a number of people who have seen the player, how that opinion matches up and trying to quantify it in a system or a measurement tool that allows you to come with a consistent outcome that makes you feel like you've come to an educated decision. Mm. How do you see analytics developing? I'm taking as read that you understand or you know, appreciate the value of advanced analytics. You know, how far are we going to go? Because you take human factors in, into account, but are we almost like moving now into a different area? And there's some talk about artificial intelligence and the person rather than the player. You know, it's a, it's a mishmash of ideas, but analytics, is that the way forward for a club of this size, do you think? It's definitely an advantage we have. And we, from some of the things we've spoken about already, have shown that when it's used properly, that it can be an advantage. I don't think it's everything. I think that's really important that people recognise it doesn't make decisions for you. It just 
allows you to educate your decisions and you've still got to have people who are prepared to to follow that through and are prepared to support that and that's that's the key thing in terms of I think people being aligned and to answer your question analytics are they the way forward they're definitely a big part of it and even in the game itself VAR which is a relatively recent addition and a lot of controversy around it my personal view is it makes things better it reduces risk mistakes sorry it's not going to be a cure-all it's not going to be get everything right but I think there are less mistakes as a result of that just maybe when there are errors they're highlighted because mm. they come so few and far between so my personal view and I think it's fair to say this club's view is that can definitely help and why wouldn't you use it if you've got access to it but it can only help if it's used in the right way by the right people who understand it. One of the things about this World Cup is that it's focused attention on you know quite literally a different area of the world in terms of the untapped talent in that sort of Asian Middle Eastern type of area. You uh, brought in uh, Karo Mitama from Japan, only three million if those figures are correct. Is that almost like a prototypical signing now that maybe people will be looking in the UAE or as their leagues and their development systems grow and in places like Japan? I think that that is the way, whether it's Japan, the UAE, Qatar, wherever that may be, I think you've got to be the way the world is now. And as we spoke about earlier, the access you can have to information, to video, you know, to being able to travel to these places is, is much more open to everyone. So I think, you know, whereas Japan and Karoo, Karoo was two years ago, I think we bought Karoo and we, we took him to loan in Belgium because we couldn't get him into the country initially. He did really well in Belgium. We got to know him, came into the building, we got to know him more. And now he's affecting our team. He's in the World Cup. And it's moved on, you know, there's been a, a good backstory behind that. We're, we're seeing the, or now we're seeing the end result of a lot of hard work by a lot of people. But in that two years, there might be another market or there might be something else that, whereby is untapped or is open. And we at Brighton, I think, have got to be aware of these opportunities and where the next one is rather than where the last one is. What's, what's happened previously, although it's a good indicator, it doesn't always mean that it's going to be what's going to happen in the future, unfortunately. Mm. We are in a time, though, of increasing elitism. There is a debate raging about state-sponsored clubs, different levels now of American investment, almost driven by the capitalist goal, which is to make as much money as possible with as little effort as possible. In all that world, that new world, I'm not sure it's that brave, but where do Brighton fit in? Because... You have to, one assumes, have the, the structure and the strategy to actually deal with those realities. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think Brighton and Hove Albion as a football club, I've got a supporter as an owner who's been a very successful businessman, who's invested in his club, who we have a chief executive who's been here for a long period of time that's allowed stability. He's very good at what he does. And that stability from the ownership the executive and some of the people on the board allows a stability within the club. And Brighton have had a stability with managers, we've had a stability in terms of how we operate and that allied to a lot of good decisions by a lot of people and a lot of hard work I think has allowed us to progress as a football club and we I think and I hope are perceived from the outside as being a good place to work, as being a stable football club and being a smaller club that can punch above its weight. And to do that, I think you've got to be aligned. You've got to have people working in your building who understand what you're doing and are willing to contribute to that. But the biggest thing, in my view, is having an ownership that's stable, that is invested for the right reasons and um, challenges a lot of the decisions you make. And, and, and everybody, I think, within our club knows how we work and knows the parameters. And I think that's a good thing and that's something I enjoy. Last time I was here in this room and your training ground, it was speaking to Graham, Graham Potter. He's moved on. Now, inevitably, that created the most comment. But also, when you look at it, he's taken his entire coaching staff with him, two key recruitment people. And this is no disrespect to Graham. Is it easier, if that strategy is right, is it easier just to 
plug in another manager or another head coach because he would have the similar principles and practices of, of the guy before. Theoretically, it should be, I think. <laughs> the reality is Graham was fantastic. I, I loved working with Graham. I loved watching his teams. I think he's going to be a really successful manager at Chelsea, and I genuinely hope he, hope he is. There was a big gap when he left because of the people that left with him, and, and that was a problem for us. It was not something we were expecting at that time, although we knew it would happen at some point. So we had to react to that. And I think the reaction has been good. But again, that comes back to my previous point about knowing what you are and what you want. And the executive and Tony knew there was a big loss. We knew we had to fill that gap. And we we're pretty quick in terms of how we went about that. We only spoke to one person. We only interviewed and wanted one person. And that person came to the club. And the initial signs are very good in terms of what we've got, in terms of the person, in terms of the, the quality of the work, and in terms of what we've seen day to day. So we're really encouraged by that. And Because he came from a similar culture and background, club, the size of club, didn't he, Sassuolo? Yeah. That was important. So in as much as you, you do your, your hard yards and your, your work in recruitment, does that extend to almost scouting coaches definitely and and staff i think people whether they're players coaches analysts medics i think it's the same principle in terms of the types of people you're building it you're bringing into your building so you've got to do your research you've got to find out about the attributes and the qualities but the person is also really important and i think again the ownership and their values and their the way they want to work filter through the club so you've got to have people within your club that align to that and understand that and want to be a part of that and I think that can be a huge strength if it's when you're competing with the likes of or trying to compete with a big six or a big seven or whatever it is now then you've got to have some unique things within your organisation that allow you to punch above your weight and compete and maybe not at this stage over a season but definitely in individual games and definitely over a, a period of games and I think that is one of the things that you've got to use to your advantage in terms of the quality of the people, having people in the building who believe, whether it's a player or a staff member, believe that they can go higher within the organisation. When Graham left, Andrew Croft, Shannon Ruth, Adam Lalana, Jack Stern stepped in and fulfilled that role for two or three weeks. Unfortunately, never got a game in that period, which was a real shame for everyone. I would have loved it. But they showed that they were up to it. They were given the opportunity and they stepped up. And I think that's really important, that within a building you have people who can see an opportunity, whether that be player or staff, to step up and, and operate at an elite Premier League level. And I think these things might seem like little things, but I think they're really big things. What about your own role? Technical director is the title. One thing that's always struck me is that the nature of the job can be encompassed by loads of titles. You know, it's one club, it's a sporting director, and another club, it's head of football. How would you describe your job? And that's a good question. <laughs> I've only been doing this job for less than a year and, and there's, there's a lot more for me to learn. And I must be honest in terms of a lot of it's been firefighting because from the day I came into the role, there's been constant flux, constant change. We've lost managers, we've lost players, we've lost academy directors, we've lost heads of recruitment. We've, you know, various things have changed and it's been an ongoing process of just dealing with change and trying to manage situations. And I think... Ultimately, that's what the job is, to try and deal with the here and now, as well as looking at the bigger picture. And I think we've tried to explain what we are as a football club. And my role is is day to day to trust the people that are managing the departments, to have good people in position to do that, to have good people working with them who can step in and, and help out with that and try and create an environment that allows people to utilise the skills that they have. So I think... That's the key thing, is being approachable, which I like to think I am, but still having the experience and the, the trust to allow good people to do their jobs, whether that's on the pitch or off the pitch. I think it's important that you trust the people you employ, and I think we've got a really good staff. We've got a really good group of players. The, Roberto has been really positive in terms of the characters that he's inherited. I think Graham deserves a lot of credit for that in terms of putting together a squad that was aligned in terms of mindset and 
how they work. And I think Roberto's had the benefit of that. And I think that for us as a club and me as a person is really, really important. Before we know it, the World Cup final will come and go. Straight back into domestic football, we've got the January transfer window on the horizon. Because of the compressed nature of this season, which is unique, do clubs have to maybe go out and buy more players to develop the depth they might need because of the demands on the players? I'm not sure about that, and I think every club's different. I, I'm astonished by the top clubs who are operating at the elite level where they must win every game. They're involved in European football week in, week out. And when everyone else gets a break, they go to the World Cup. I think the demands that are put on the top, top players now are, are exceptional. And I think, you know, we underestimate that. We underestimate the quality of the, the person, the Ronaldos and the Messis that are operating at that level week in, week out for years and years and years. It's just an incredible thing to do. And to operate at the top level with these top clubs under the pressure they're under and under the scrutiny they're under, and they're well paid, clearly, but in my mind, they, they completely deserve it. I think we all want to be footballers. We've all had different degrees of success in doing it. But those guys that are doing it now and the demands that they're under, for me, they're the, the best athletes in the world in terms of how often they do it, the performances they put, and the, the sort of vulnerability they're prepared to expose themselves to, knowing that if it does go wrong or they don't succeed, then you know they know they're going to get a barrage of, barrage of criticism for that. So. I just look at it and it amazes me, you know, in terms of the, the demands that are put on them and, and what they continually seem to produce. As a final question, it's, it's um, a pretty obvious one in some ways. As I said, January transfer window. Now, I don't expect you to be specific here, but if you want to be, please do. Do you expect to be sellers in this window? No. I think that's quite an easy question to answer. We don't expect or want to be sellers it's not to say that we we won't be and I, I don't think we should be afraid of that and I know we're not afraid of that it'll be on our terms I think we've been fortunate enough to get into the position whereby players want to be here I don't think players are kicking down the door to leave I think we've shown on the pitch that we can be successful we can compete with some of the games we've had this season last season that we do give players an opportunity to compete at the top level. I'd like to think we have a, a nice environment in terms of the facilities that the ownership have provided us with are elite. They're in, in my view, in the top 10 in the world. And I think Brighton and Hove as a place to live is a good place to live. It's a good place to bring up a family and I think it's a good place to develop your career. So I think there's a lot of things in our favour that allow us to be to have a, a level of control over how our squad looks and and if and when we lose players. Although, I think I said earlier, we're not we're not afraid of losing players. And when Eve Basuma moved on, it created an opportunity for Moises Caicedo. And that's the sort of pathway that we want to we wanna create, whereby we shouldn't be afraid of people leaving. We don't want them to leave. But if they do, then we recover. We try and prosper. We prepare before it happens, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, so there's no chance of you becoming victims of your own success in that way? I think there is, but I think it's a good thing. I think at some stage you have to sell players to create opportunities for others and opportunity often can be the hardest thing and sometimes you never know until you're exposed. Moises Caicedo made his debut because Jakob Moder got injured. That's what happened in the Premier League and, and he took that opportunity and then Jakob Moder will be coming back soon and then who's to know what his next opportunity is and, and where that goes for him. So. Football's a funny game and, you know, it changes very quickly and you've got to be able to react, but you've also got to know, you know, why you're doing it. And I think you know, that's definitely one of our strengths is, is knowing what you're doing and what you are and, and I say, giving an opportunity and a pathway for, for young players especially to get an opportunity is a massive thing. Well, thanks for your time and all the best. Thank you. Enjoy that. Well, I found that a far-reaching and illuminating conversation. As David admits, he's been firefighting for probably a year at Brighton. One thing that really struck me, Tony, and this is in your orbit, really, the idea of scouting the coach 
when uh, a time of change. I think that was really fascinating insight. Yeah, it was. I, we've spoken about Brighton before. This is a club that is um, incredibly well structured and managed from top to bottom. And you're right, that fascinating thing to hear from David was that not only was Roberto De Zerbi the club's number one target when Graham Potter left, he was their only target. That speaks to me of a level of kind of focus, realism and contingency planning that you don't see at other supposedly bigger clubs than Brighton. And what's really interesting is that I, I was lucky enough to spend some time at the Brighton Training Centre. And these places are centres now, they're not grounds, they are definitely centres mm. recently. And I asked some of the characters around there, mostly in the academy, about Potter's departure. And the overwhelming sense I got from all of them, actually, was that it was a really emotional time for the whole club. Potter's style of management is such that he embraces everyone at the club at all levels. And it's inevitable that when somebody like that, who has done a really good job at a club, leaves, they will be missed. But at the same time, there was also a complete kind of sans foi about it. Like, there was this accept... They all knew. They all know that the club has a plan. They all buy into it. And there was an acceptance across the entire club that, one, he would probably leave. Two, obviously, a new guy would come in. And three, that that new guy who came in would probably be a good choice. Like, to have that kind of level of confidence at all levels of a club is really, really... Was really taking. Um, and as David said to you, that the early signs are that De Zerbi is going to be a very good appointment and that Potter and the kind of catalogue of staff that he took with him won't be as missed as maybe they, they thought they would be when they first left. Mm. I thought it was also interesting, Rich, is that just the breadth, the geographical breadth more than anything else of Brighton's recruitment. OK, they do go young, but also you know, there are pockets, aren't there? You know, there were three Ecuadorians in that group. Um, I think Matoma has been one of the unsung heroes of this World Cup with with Japan. You know, there's someone who went there for three million. Can you think of a better, more productive recruitment model? It's difficult to to think. I, I mean, of course, when Michael Edwards was at, was at Liverpool, you know, he did a fantastic job there. But in terms of a club almost punching above their weight and able to sustain that it's difficult to look past Brighton really and I think you know a lot of clubs look at them with, with admirable eyes really because what they've able to to build and, and cultivate over the years has, has been phenomenal I think what, what, what David Weir said in, in the interview is really important about the club having stability and you know what what Tony Bloom Paul Barber have done there by allowing that stability is allowed for for players to develop and staff as well. So by that, I mean, allowing the recruitment staff to, to really, you know, do their jobs, pro- you know, do their jobs properly and, and, and really identifying that talent across the globe, not just in, in the areas where, you know, the usual scouts will attend. And I think David said a really interesting thing about looking for new opportunities, not just where things are now and almost having that foresight to, you know, have that planning to, okay, where, where's the next hotbed of talent? So, I mean, they tapped into Ecuador very, very early. And as you've seen, you know, three players at the World Cup, albeit through different, um, you know, different means of joining the club. You know, I thought it was really interesting, you know, the thought process behind that. And as you say, of course, Brighton, they want to, they want to be in a position where, of course, they want to, you know, progress up the table and really, you know, maybe challenge for Europe one day. But you know, it was interesting to hear, okay, they're not buying ready-made players. They're buying players who can progress, who can develop under them. And then if they do sell, they have a contingency plan. We saw it with the manager and we, see, we saw that last season, you know, the likes of Cucurella going for 60 million, then they reinvest that again. And it's a, it's a cycle, but that cycle is only really allowed to, to cultivate and, and, and to breed because of the stability of the club. Because everybody knows what the ethos is. Everyone's going in the right direction. And because of that, it allows the employees at the club to, as you say, to hone their skills, to, to, to develop. As you say, whether that's the players on the pitch, whether it's the coaching staff, whether it's the recruitment model, everybody's pulling in the right direction, but they're given that time to develop and, and to find the right players. You know, Brighton don't just buy players haphazardly. We, we see there's a real structure in place. And when the players are ready, as David Weir said about Casado, he came in when uh, Jakob Müller got injured and he's not looked back. And that's just one example of that contingency planning and, you know, that, that foresight to really progress and move forward. So when you're looking at a club and a recruitment model, I think Brighton are, are definitely gold standard there. Brighton's the closest the Premier League has to the Red Bull model that we've talked about a few times, isn't it? And that, that comes from that level of stability. And it also comes, as Rich said, to the, from that honesty when you talk to players, when you recruit them. You're not selling them the total dream, you're selling them their path to the dream. 
and you're saying, we're going to bring you in and we're going to develop you and you're going to move on somewhere great and do great things. And Brighton, they're not the only club in, in England doing that. You know, Southampton, Norwich, to a certain degree, have both, have both been doing something quite similar. Just Brighton do it bigger and better. Yeah. Let's look at the widest uh, possible view of this World Cup, if we could, Rich. One of the thought processes I came away with from that conversation with David was that, you know, is our field of vision too narrow? When infrastructure's changing, the game is becoming globalised, should we be looking to Africa or Asia, Middle East, for the new global superstar or the next talent hotbed? I've been really struck with, with the Moroccans, the joy that their progress to the last eight triggered all around the world. You know, we saw it in London, in Paris, in Barcelona, huge outbreaks of joy, which I don't think we can ever get enough of. What are the lessons of of Morocco's progress to to the quarterfinals, do you think? I think that it's, you know, I I don't think these things happened by accident. A few years ago, Morocco built a state-of-the-art training complex and there's some where, you know, all, all all of their age group sides train I guess akin to St George's Park I guess and you know when 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 we're seeing you know these countries where maybe investment hasn't been the best when we're seeing them invest in their infrastructure invest in their in their young players and you can see that there's a real plan in place there you know we're, we're only going to see as you say the, the globalization of football we're going to see more teams from these parts of the world Africa Middle East Asia progressing and, and doing well and, and also as well I think it's really interesting because we're seeing a lot now and there's a big debate especially with African teams where you might have players who are born in, say, France or England, but are choosing to play for, you know, the country of their of their parents' birth. And I think having that as well is also really important because, of course, naturally it would make the team stronger, not from a um, bias or, or arrogant point of view, but as you say, you know, they're growing up in, you say, academies, you know, Chelsea, Arsenal, whatever, it can only bode those countries well by bringing that quality to that national team setup, and it's a, it's a debate. It's something that Nigeria have, have tried to do in recent years. Obviously, we've seen Ghana do that at this World Cup with the likes of um, Tech Lamptey, Naki Williams, just to name a few. And I think seeing Morocco do that, and we've seen the success of Hakimi, you know, born in Spain, and is now you know spearheading the, the Moroccan say resurgence, I should say. So, you know, I think over the next five ten years, we're really going to see a shift in in players playing for, you know, the country of their, maybe their parents' birth. As the infrastructure improves, as the, you know, the, the kind of FAs get their, get their structures in, in gear, we're only going to see more and more players, you know, feeling comfortable saying, OK, if England or France or Spain is not a route for me, I'm going to play for Ghana or I'm going to play for Nigeria, I'm going to play for Morocco because I can see the pathway there. I can see the management is good, the structure's good, where maybe it's not been so in the past. And I can see myself doing well on an international stage. That's a massive point. The interesting thing, sorry to throw my but the, the interesting thing there is that someone like Oshin Roberts, who's now at Crystal Palace with Patrick Vieira, was technical director at the Moroccan FA for, for a couple of seasons. It's like these, Morocco is showing a template of investing money and, and building a structure, exactly as Richard described, that makes these players want to go and play in that, in that infrastructure and play for that national team. Where even recently, I'm thinking of someone like Joel Matip at Liverpool, who played for Cameroon, but retired at, what, 25, 26? Just wasn't interested anymore because he's basically a shambles. Whereas Morocco is showing the way also. But, I mean, you know, the, manager, the manager's French-born as well, isn't it? There is just, it feels like, and we say exactly the same, it's a, it's a different background, it's exactly the same with England at the moment. If the players want to go and play for that team and have a good experience doing it, that team is going to perform better. The question, mm. the question for African football, I guess, is, are more countries going to put in the investment and follow the template that maybe Morocco have, have so successfully set in the last few seasons? Yeah, I suppose it's fortunate for Portugal that Morocco took so much out of themselves, both physically and mentally, in, in that last 16 game. What about Portugal, Rich? Are they finally free from the, the shackles of Ronaldo's ego? It seems to be that way, didn't it? I mean, obviously, you throw the obvious or well, the caveat that Switzerland did have uh, an illness that ravaged their squad. But I think even if Switzerland were at full pelt, I don't think they'd have been able to contain Portugal in, in any shape or form. I think, you know, Portugal were phenomenal the other night. As you say, they, they looked free, didn't they? They looked, 
you know, they're attacking players, you know, like so Jao Felix and, you know, Bruno Fernandes, you know, just they just, just, just they, were, they were just themselves, weren't they? You know, Bernardo Silva was, was fantastic as well. And of course, you know, uh, Gonzalo Ramos, you know, his hat trick, you know, again, we talk about youth and youthful exuberance and, and being fearless. And that is that right there in a nutshell. Of course, you know, again, you're throwing a caveat, okay, Ronaldo did, didn't look too happy, but, you know, he was involved in the celebrations and, you know, being a good teammate, I guess. But, I think I think if you know Portugal wants to evolve, we're talking about you know the kind of old guard shifting. You know, again, there's something which is spoken about at club level, where he may just have to accept that he is a substitute, as a super sub, and you know what a super sub to have if you're chasing a game to have Ronaldo to, to come on. So, I think I think Portugal have been better than uh, than Manchester United, obviously. Yeah. Um, at that process, you know, there have been times where Ronaldo has been in the bench and, and come on and, and made an impact in games. But I think, as you say, from a neutral's perspective, you know, you want to see free-flowing football. You want to see good attacking football. And I think that was probably, well, it was by far their best their best performance of the tournament, one of the best overall. You want to see these players thriving and, and, and showcasing their ability. And if that means Ronaldo has to be in the bench, then, then so be it. Yeah, you know, you, you were struck by... You know the the aptness or the appropriateness of that performance by Portugal. You know that was football circle of life right in front of your eyes. Ramos coming in, getting his hat trick, becoming a global figure overnight, and uh, uh, Ronaldo. When all the re- the celebrations were going on in the centre circle after the game, there's this long shot image of him walking on his own almost stalking back to the dressing room. It's probably one of his last hello mum moments, isn't it? Brazil, Tony, they've got the best quarterfinal draw, haven't they, against Croatia? Probably, yeah. Croatia are kind of... We talked about some of the problems that teams have had with getting old. Belgium did it kind of disgracefully and went out tail between their legs. Croatia was still just about holding it together. There's more togetherness in that squad than there was in the Belgium squad, obviously, but they do look like an ageing squad that, that are going to struggle. And I think, you know, Brazil, you know, that that front four, I mean, South Korea, as Graham Souness so curmudgeonly described on TV the other night, South Korea couldn't have played any more, given Brazil an, an easier task in the way they set up. But that front four are a seriously talented bunch. But it's also, you know, <laughs> that ability from deep areas. I mean, Richarlison's goal against South Korea, the build-up play between Marquinhos and Thiago Silva, who is about 120 years old, but looking absolutely phenomenal, was, was just superb. And they can really play. They can really... And, and I say that, but as ever, they, they do have that steel that those the recent Brazil World Cup winning teams have got. You know, they've got three centre-backs in their back four. Casemiro is, is one of the great holding midfielders. I absolutely love the guy. He looks, you know, reminds me a little bit of Mauro Silva from the 94 team in that just, you know, very, very good footballer who just gets the job done. So, yeah, they'd be... I mean, I get most things horribly wrong and I'd hardly stuck my neck out in saying I thought Brazil would win at the start of the tournament, but I, still, I think they probably still will. Yeah, there's there's something about... You know, we're all talking about Jogo Benito again, aren't we, which is far better. It certainly sounds so much better than that translated version, you know, the beautiful game, which is almost as bad as anyone talking about footy, which actually does my head in. The, the last winners, Rich, in 2002 were a pretty anarchic bunch, amazingly talented. This group now, and you know, it actually does go back almost like to the globalisation of football, is that most of these guys are now European bred almost as footballers, aren't they? You know, they developed initially in, in Brazil, but then the moment they come out, that's when their real development occurs. Yeah, no, exactly. And I guess if you're looking at, I guess, you know, the, the main competitions, I guess, in world football, you, you know, you want to be in Europe, you want to be at, at the top teams. It's interesting you mentioned the 2002 team. I don't know what you guys think, but I still think, you know, if, if the two sides were to play each other, 2002 against now, I think the 2002 side would just edge it because, I mean, I mean that front three is, is just ridiculous. But as, as Tony said, you know, the team today do have that still and, and that know-how to get through games and they have experience. We're talking about youth, the likes of you know, Venetius Gina, of course, who's a fantastic talent, but then you have the experience of, of Neymar, of Thiago Silva as well. And and combining, as you say, that, that steely know-how and experience with, with the with the Jogo Benito is is, you know, 
it, it's a fantastic blend. I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned Jacob Benito, something that I think 2006, when there was the whole Nike adverts and stuff, and something that I grew up on, is something that we all want to see, right? We want to see the skills, we want to see the dancing, we want to see the, the fun, because football is fun. We want it to be fun at the end of the day. But combining that with, as you say, the, the steel, the know-how to manage games, I think it makes Brazil clear favourites, as Tony said. They're also playing for a coach who's been there for, a, this is his second cycle in a World Cup, you know, and there's a real sense, there's a real sense of togetherness. I know they focused on him getting Tite dancing with the players after they scored whichever goal it was the other night, but there's a real sense of, of development continuity in this squad while embracing the, the, the younger players who have come in. It's a, it's a really trite point, but it's an obvious one. They've, every player in the squad has played, you know, they brought on, they brought on Weverton for the last 10 minutes. Against against South Korea, just to make sure that everybody had got a game. I mean, like, without to, on, on the subject of goalkeepers, they also have the best goalkeeper in the world. Mm. Uh, and I may, I'm, everyone knows I'm biased on that score, but they do. They are just, you know, and I think it's one of those things where, isn't it, the neutrals watch on and say, you know, they still support Brazil. And there is a feeling around this group, around this set of players and the coaching staff, that there is a real positivity about it. it they probably feel it's their destiny which again is, can be a big motivating factor. Sometimes it can be a burden, but it seems with this lot that it's the opposite. And of course, now we've said this, you know, Croatia will eke out a 1-0 win and, uh, and we'll all go home unhappy, but um, I, don't, I don't think so. Yeah, well, the Netherlands, Rich, are defying their own traditions, aren't they? You know, there's this new pragmatism bred by Van Gaal. Could he carry this team beyond Argentina? No reason why not. It's interesting uh, you mentioned how they're, they're set up and it's a far, not a far cry, but it's a change and a shift from, from the usual Netherlands that, that we see. My colleague Michael Cox wrote a really interesting piece on, on their setup and how they, they're you know, going man for man in, in, in midfield and you know their, their back three. They, they have one defender who seems to be 10 yards deeper than, than the rest of the back line, which is something which we've not seen in a number of years. But as you say, it's proven to be effective for them. And... Of course, you know, their passing ability is great. We saw that against USA, they're two fantastic team goals. But I think, as you say, the pragmatism is, is something that's there and they may not have the star quality up front, although, OK, Gakpo's getting on the score sheet, but they're scoring at key moments in, 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 in games and, and, and just picking teams off. And, you know, whether they'll be too streetwise for Argentina will be, will be, you know, something that remains to be seen. But I don't think it's cut and dry. I think a lot of people will see Argentina as favourites. But I think Netherlands, with their, with their pragmatism, you know, they seem to be playing like a team who are bigger than the sum of their parts. And I think that is really important in tournament football. They seem to have a togetherness, which we've not always seen with Netherlands sides as well, um, all pulling in, in the same direction, which, of course, tournament football is really important. And, you know, in Louis van Gaal, they've got a, a, a fantastic tactician. So... I, I, that game's really difficult to call. I, I don't think it's cut and dry. A, a lot of people have Argentina as favourites there, but I feel like Netherlands, just the way they've set up and you say that, they're, they're, OK, they might not have the star quality up front, but you know, they are a threat in key moments of games and can score goals in, in key moments. And I think that would be really important. Yeah. Well, as we know, Tony, Lionel Messi is one of the few athletes to match Michael Jordan in terms of aura and sustained impact. Um, so it was pretty obvious that Qatar will be characterised as, you know, his last dance, if you like. I know this borders on sporting heresy to even suggest it, but is this World Cup win beyond him? Well, all the previous ones have been, haven't they? <laughs> Arguably with better teams. I, I, you know, I think, you know, much in the same way we'd all love Brazil to win the World Cup or we'd all love England to win the World Cup, I think we'd all probably get quite a lot of joy out of Argentina with Lionel Messi winning the World Cup. But I just I just can't see it. I don't think they're very good. You know, he he provides moments of magic. And, you know, I mean, he's, he's just watching him move around the pitch, both when Argentina are in possession and out of possession, he's just a wonder. He just barely moves. And then suddenly he'll just find a pocket of space as he did for the goal against Mexico and somebody leaves him and he just stands still. The person follows the ball for a minute as they did and before you know it, the ball's in the back of the net and he has that absolutely wondrous, unique ability. The, the, that magic is still there but they've got into the quarterfinals of the World Cup without playing particularly well. Don't think they were particularly good in their group games. Wasn't really blown away by them against Australia and everyone got, got very excited about Messi in that game but Australia had a really good chance to equalise in the dying minutes and, and they're they really weren't very good either. I think the Netherlands are the first team that Argentina have come up against who have got any real quality. And they may not be the most exciting team in the world, but I think if they can find a way to stop Messi, and my guess is that they that they will, 
that, that they should win the game, which probably sounds quite boring and sad, but I think Messi's, Messi's chance, best chance to win the World Cup has, has gone. OK, chat, so it's, it's make your mind up time. Can you give me your final four, please? Rich, start with you, please. I'm just going to go straight into it. Brazil, Portugal. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I spoke about Netherlands being, I just spoke them up really highly, but I'm just going to say Argentina. I just think just, you know, I just, just for the, I just see Messi just pulling something out of the bag and, 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 and doing something there. Don't know why, probably going to be wrong, but Argentina and uh, I'm going to say England. Let's do it. England as well. So yeah, Brazil, Portugal, Argentina and England. Tony? Having spoken Argentina down, I'm going to very much say Netherlands, Brazil, Portugal, and three Lions, England expects, etc. They'll, they'll do it. Good. How about you? Good man. Well, you know, there, I get the sense that the football world is, is slightly shifting off its axis. You know, it's the first Arab World Cup. The sun's setting on Ronaldo's career. As we've discussed, this is Messi's last chance to shine. Now, my heart says Morocco, Brazil, Argentina, and England. My head, may I be forgiven, says it will be Portugal, Brazil, Netherlands, and France. Sorry, before I run for cover, I'd like to thank David Weir for his observations and to express my gratitude to Tony and Richard for their insight. You might be in the pub on Saturday night. I plan on watching England from behind the sofa, praying that I'm wrong. Enjoy. Enjoy.